Hi, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to Poem Praise 2. I do thank you for tuning in and peace and blessings be upon you and your family this evening. Now we are going to get um, into um, the names of God. And for this take, we're definitely going to get into the first chapter I am looking, this is going to be the first take of the first chapter. I'm seeing this kind of a little bit of a longer chapter. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into chapter one, which is entitled, What's in a Name? And it goes like this. The Great Poet. William Shakespeare once posed this question, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And most people today would agree. Our modern society places little significance on the meaning of a name. Parents usually name their children after beloved relatives or well-known persons. Sometimes they pick a child's name merely because it sounds good. But seldom would they give any thought to the meaning of a name. Yet, names do mean something. Ideally, they correspond directly to the one designated by the name. For example, did you know that the name Kenneth comes from the Greek? Word meaning to know. So a person named Kenneth is supposed to be knowledgeable. Since the name Diana comes from the Greek word meaning of God. A girl with that name is supposed to be simply divine. In her beauty are other qualities. Other people's names are derived from words of the ancient Greek, Latin, Norse, or other languages. And most of those names have some special Meaning, the same is true of place names. You probably know, for example, that the name Philadelphia means city of brotherly love. It comes from the Greek words phileo, to love, and delphos, city. The name Jerusalem means city of peace. Being derived from the Hebrew word shalom, peace. There is probably some significance behind the name of your town or city. Hmm. My point is simply this. While it may have all have, excuse me, I'm going to start that over again, y'all. My point is simply this. While it may have been all right for Shakespeare to shrug off the importance of a name, we should not take names so lightly. Often a name provides an important clue to the nature of a person or place. This is certainly true of God. The Bible refers to God by many different names, and each one reveals some aspect of God's character or his relationship with us. The translators who gave us the King James Version and other English versions of the Bible simply translate his name as God or 
lowered. But significantly, several Greek or Hebrew names are used in the original manuscripts. If you want to become a serious student of the Word of God, you should be familiar with those Greek and Hebrew names because they contain a wealth of truth about the wonderful God we serve. God's credentials. For centuries, people did not know the name of God. That may come as a surprise to you, but it's true. When God walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't necessary for them to know his name because they knew him intimately. They did not need to call upon him or invoke him in prayer for he was their daily companion. Then they disobeyed him and were driven out the garden, forced to make a living by the sweat of their brow and the labor of their hands. They and their descendants became offering sacrifices to him and calling upon him in prayer. In fact, Genesis 4.26 says, It was not until the birth of Adam's grandson, Enos, that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. See Genesis 5, 3. And Seth was 105 years old when his son Enos was born. See Genesis 5, 6. So for over 200 years, despite the fall, men and women did not find it necessary to call on God by name. They were still that aware of his presence. I often wish that we could regain the intimate state of communion with the Lord. In my own prayer life, I have felt very near to him at times, so near that it was not necessary to offer him any formal prayer. It was enough just to be in his presence. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 8. And that's the kind of experience he has given me in prayer. Yet none of us has regained the debt of intimacy with the Lord that would let us worship him heart to heart as Adam's family did. Paul knew that one day he would meet God. He affirmed, then shall I know even as also I am known. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. All of us look forward to such a day. But for now, we are limited by our human imperfections and the distractions of this carnal world. We must shut the door of our prayer closet and focus our thoughts on God if we are to have any fellowship with Him. The human race has needed to pray this way ever since the days of Enos. Humankind fell into deep corruption in the centuries that followed Adam. Finally, God had to destroy most of the human race with a worldwide flood, saving only a godly man named Noah and his family in one last effort to salvage humanity. The Bible says that when the flood waters receded and Noah's great wooden ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, he left the ark to build an altar and offer sacrifices to God. See Genesis 8, 18 through 21. He wanted to make a fresh beginning for the human race and he started by worshiping God. Centuries later, God spoke to a godly man named Abram and invited him to leave his native homeland 
in what is now Iran and travel to Canaan. As soon as Abram arrived in the land, he also built an offer, excuse me, an altar. He built an altar and offered sacrifices to God, see Genesis 12, 7. Notice how important the worship of God was to these men. Each of them celebrated the landmark events of his life by building an altar, burning a sacrifice on it, and uttering praises to God. Worship was a way of life for them. Yet God has to remind them again and again of who he was. He put a rainbow in the sky to remind Noah that he was a benevolent God and he would never destroy the earth with water. See Genesis 90, 14 through 17. When Abram worshipped him, he said, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Genesis 15, 1. He also said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Shaldees, or Shaldees, I'll spell it for you, C-H-A-L-D-E-E-S, to give thee this land to inherit it. Genesis 15, 7. Finally, he said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Genesis 17, 1. It was as if God had to present his credentials every time he talked with them because they kept forgetting who he was. The God my folks worshipped. When Abraham's grandson Jacob dreamed of a ladder reaching to the throne of heaven, God said to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, Jacob's immediate father. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Genesis 28, 13. God had already promised the land to Abraham and his descendants. Now he would fulfill that promise to Jacob and his immediate family. But God had to keep reminding Jacob of who he was. When Jacob went to work for his uncle Laban in the land of Haran, God spoke to him in another dream and said, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowedest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. Genesis 31, 13. Yet when Jacob talked about God, notice how he referred to him. The God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac. Genesis 31, 42. And the God of Abraham, and the God of Nahor, and the God of thy father. Genesis 31, 53. If Jacob ever knew God's name, he seemed to have forgotten it. He referred to him only as the God my folks always worshipped. I'm afraid this is the only way many people identify God today. Sure, I know God, they say. My folks have worshipped him for years. He and I are not personal friends, but he's a good friend of my parents. Yet there is a world of difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Someone who knows him only as the God my folks worshipped simply knows about him. 
we need to become so intimately acquainted with God that we fall on our knees and say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. John 20, 28. Of course, Jacob may have referred to God as the God of Abraham and Isaac. As a gesture of respect, he may have been underscoring the fact that God had been faithful to his forefathers and was also faithful to him. Some Bible commentators interpret Jacob's words this way. But I think Jacob's spiritual track record says otherwise. He was a cunning, deceitful man who tricked his older brother out of his birthright and made off with part of his uncle's flock. Only in times of crisis did Jacob turn to God. Jacob's brother Esau learned he was coming home and went out to meet him. Jacob was desperate. He wailed to the God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return unto thy country. Genesis 32, 9. Jacob was still on the very formal terms with God, not friendly terms. Only after Jacob's faith had been tested a great deal more, did God appear to him again and say, Thy name shall be called anymore. Excuse me. Thy name shall not be called anymore, Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. Genesis thirty-five ten. The Hebrew name Israel literally means ruling with God. And God said unto him, I am the God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee and kings shall come out of thy loins. Genesis 35, 11. Not only did God give Jacob a new name, but he revealed more of his own divine nature to him. He revealed that he was all powerful and able to do anything. He promised to do. So his vow to bring a nation and a company of nations out of this man was no casual promise. It carried the authority of an omnipotent God, a God whom Jacob had come to trust that does complete the first take of what's in a name. So I want you and your family to be blessed and stay tuned for the next take. A preview of the next take title is Tell Them I Am That I Am Sent You. So until then, be blessed. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. And until next time, later y'all.